Radio. You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. It's 11 o'clock at night. It's dark. You're sitting in front of the mirror getting ready for bed. There's nobody else in the house. You see something move in the corner of your eye. You glance to your right, but you don't see anything. Another minute goes by, and you think you see movement again. So you slowly turn to your left, but again, the room is empty. You turn back around, and staring you face to face in the mirror is a cat. You jump back, because you don't have a cat, and there's no cat in the room. But there he is, staring at you in the mirror. Welcome to Paranormal Pets, where you can always expect the unexpected. Each week, we'll discuss all aspects of weird or spiritual animal encounters, ghosts, totems, psychic animals, animal souls, animal angels, and animals in religion, with a little cryptozoology thrown in. Now, step into the supernatural world of pets with your Paranormal Pets ghostly host, our ghost host. Hello and welcome to Paranormal Pets. I'm your host, Brandi Stark, and this is our first episode for 2013. So first, let me be the last to wish you a Happy New Year, since we're running a little behind this month. But because we'd like to have something auspicious, something good for the new year, I am going to present a presentation that I am doing for the Museum of Fine Arts here in St. Petersburg, Florida. I've been asked to speak about their non-Western collection or some pieces from it, and I have chosen to discuss the Ganesh figures. So I have a little bit of uh, a presentation that I'll run by you, and we'll see where it goes. So both this episode and my presentation are called Ganesh for Success, and we'll continue with it right after these messages. Now, time for something really scary. A word from our sponsors. Paranormal pets will reappear before you can say Bigfoot. Don't run away. Petco, where the pets go. Petco, where the pets go. Pet Life Radio has tail wagging, fur flying, fabulous deals for our listeners from Petco. Get six dollars off your order of sixty dollars or more, and up to forty percent off the entire Petco site. That's right, but that's not all. Because you're a Pet Life Radio listener, you'll also get free shipping on your order of forty nine dollars or more. Six dollars off, up to forty percent off, and free shipping from Pet Life Radio and Petco. To get these. Awesome deals, go to petcodeals.com. That's petcodeals.com. Petco, where the pets go. Hi, this is Michelle Fern, host of Best Bets for Pets. I want to tell you about a brand new product that has customers raving. It's Stop Quiet Off Dog Training Spray. It's made from all natural organic botanicals and will not harm or scare your dog in any way. There is nothing else on the market like it. It works because dogs don't like the smell, so they stop the behavior. Stop Quiet Off works by spraying it on the chest or near their nose so they get a good whiff of the spray. It works on barking, jumping up, rushing doors, stealing food off the counter, and begging and eating unwanted items on walks. To order your bottle of Stop Quiet Off, go to DogTrainingSpray.com. That's DogTrainingSpray.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Did you hear that? Our commercials have mysteriously disappeared. Paranormal Pets is back with our haunted host, our ghost host. Welcome back to Paranormal Pets. We are going to continue with our Success for Ganesh episode. And 
or Ganesh for success, either way. And I just thought a little mood music might help put us in our proper perspective. So, Ganesh, I'm sure most of you who know who exactly who he is. Uh, he's an interesting figure. He is a he's an elephant-headed man god. He's one of the most intriguing visual images, truly, to come from India, in my opinion. He is just a, a rather, he's just hard not to see. He's hard not to look at. He is a, a very intricate and very symbolic figure, quite frankly. His name actually comes from two terms, Gana, meaning followers of Shiva, and Isha, meaning Lord, because he is appointed the Lord of the followers of Shiva. He actually has a ton of religious meanings, but his primary, he is the remover of obstacles. He is the physical embodiment of the Om, the sacred syllable that represents all of creation, right? The A-U-M, creation, the maintenance, the preservation, and the M, the destruction. He represents wisdom. He represents a positive start to new ventures, such as marriage, building a house, starting a business, etc. And he is also the first god to receive prayers in a worship service. Again, he's pretty universally known through India, and I believe that he was actually sent up with the Voyager, if I'm not mistaken, with the, the satellite that is supposed to encounter new life and tell them a little bit about us. If you want a mantra of Ganesh... To bestow wisdom, courage, and confidence to start a new enterprise, such as, oh, let's say 2013, we've got the Om Shri Ganesh Ayanama. Now, I apologize because my accent is terrible, but it gives you an idea of how he's addressed. Oh, great Ganesh. His birth story is rather unique. His mother is Parvati, and the story goes, Parvati is kind of this very powerful female force. And the story goes that Parvati, who is the wife of Shiva, wanted a bath. Now, in case you're curious, in Hinduism, there is a Hindu trinity which reflects the Brahma, the unknowable, unfathomable God. God is merciful in Hinduism and says, well, I got to have a way to connect with creation, even though technically God is in us. So the Hindu trinity consists of Brahman, the creator, He really isn't worshipped a lot directly. He's worshipped when you worship the other gods, if you will. There's one major temple in India that he is worshipped at. And that's saying something because India's got temples and shrines everywhere. Then you have Vishnu, who preserves the universe and actually sends down what are known as avatars. If you are familiar with Krishna or Rama, the Bhagavad Gita, of course, fantastic reading. If you've never read it, you should read it. So Vishnu... Uh, is the preserver of the universe. Part of the reason why an easy connection here is that he sends down avatars is that he maintains the universe, and in order to maintain the universe, there has to be an appropriate balance between good and bad, or at least appropriate examples, right? So he kind of writes the universe every now and again. Shiva is the destroyer, the god of ghosts, and the god of teachers. Wait, wait, education, part of this whole destruction thing, whatever, but... As such, uh, I actually adore Shiva. I think he's fantastic. He is not really a glum god because in destroying, he destroys things that are holding you back, allowing you to be reborn. Now, Shiva is married to Parvati. That's what I was introducing earlier. And Parvati is, as I said, a very powerful feminine force. Kind of uh, had to tame Shiva show him that he was her equal, did some hardcore meditation, out-meditated Shiva. Very interesting, very powerful feminine force. And the story is very basically that she wanted a bath. So she posted Shiva's bull, Nandi. Now this is kind of how it works. Most of the gods are associated with the vehicle, with the sacred plant or animal that conveys them from place to place and is associated with them. Shiva's vehicle is the bull. It's a big white Brahma bull. So, kind of like a guard dog, she has this bull posted outside of her home, or at least outside the bath. And she says, don't let anyone in. And the bull says, okay, as bulls are wont to do. And as it stands there, as he stands there, who should show up but Shiva? Shiva wants to go home. And he says, move, Nandy. I'm going in. Well, the bull is so loyal to Shiva that all the god has to say is move, and he moves. 
And so in, Shiva walks on Parvati, and she's a little upset. Now, even though he's her husband, I guess everybody needs some me time. So what she does is she scrapes turmeric, which is like a, like a paste, a cleansing paste, or in some accounts, she scrapes off dirt from her body, and she molds it into the body of a little boy. And interestingly enough, she breathed life into it. She gave him her breath of life. So we actually have a somewhat immaculate conception here, if you will. She brings the boy to life and says, you are Ganesh, you are my son. I want to take a bath, guard the house. Now in the meantime, Shiva has gone out. He's doing his godly thing. Ganesh stands outside the house and Parvati has her me time. Well, Shiva comes home and there's a strange boy standing outside the house and he says, move boy, I want to go in. And Ganesh has never seen Shiva. Shiva's never seen Ganesh and Ganesh says, no. His orders are to guard the house. And eventually what ends up happening is Shiva says, all right, if you won't move, I'm sending my army after you. And he sends his army and Ganesh defeats them because Ganesh is actually a warrior as well. And then finally Shiva battles Ganesh himself. And even though Ganesh is a great warrior, he's not a Shiva. And Shiva wins the fight by beheading Ganesh. Well, in the meantime, Parvati has staggered out of her bath again, comes outside, discovers the dead body of her son, and she's furious. And she says, that's it. I am destroying creation. This is over. Well, Brahman, the god of creation, not real thrilled to hear that, negotiates with her and says, listen, what can we do? And Parvati says, there are two things. You can bring my son back to life. And once he is back to life, you can make him the head of of all prayers. He gets all worship first. Well, she was a little remorseful, killed his wife's kid, says, all right. And the story is that Shiva either sends out Brahman or his own followers. And he says, bring me the head of the first animal you see. And some accounts actually say lying facing north, but okay. The first animal is the elephant. Some say it's Indra's elephant. That's uh, the vehicle of another god, but that's another story. So they bring the head back to Shiva, and Shiva fastens it to the dead body of the boy. And then he breathes life into the child, and Ganesh is reborn. And true to their promises, Ganesh is the first god to be worshipped. And both Shiva and Parvati have now completely asexually produced their son. So it's, it's a really interesting story right there. Now, Ganesh, as with most of the Hindu, most all of the Hindu gods, has a lot of symbolism with him. Now, just in case you've never seen Ganesh, once more, some physical attributes that you can look for. He's got the body of a man and the head of an elephant. It's a good sign right there that's Ganesh. He usually has one tusk with the other one broken. He's got a large belly. Across his chest, he has a, from his left shoulder down, he has a sacred thread. And sometimes the sacred thread shows up in the form of a snake, like his father, Shiva. He has four to 14 hands because he is divine. And he is oftentimes shown in the company of a rat, sometimes uh, also defined as a mouse or sometimes called a shrew. I say it's a rat, quite frankly, but whatever. So if you are to take the statue of Shiva and break it down, I always find this fascinating because folks really don't know Hinduism very well and they tend to forget that a lot of things that that are visual in Hinduism are also allegories. Uh, We forget the same thing in our own Western religion. Walk past a bazillion stained glass windows and yeah, there's some saints. There might be, you know, the stations of the cross, depending on what kind of church you're in. You know, you get used to the symbolism, but there's many meanings. You can take it on surface value or you can take it through a symbolic value. So we're going to break down a little bit of the body of Ganesh. And we're going to start with the head. Uh, Obviously, he has an elephant head. Good start. This represents auspiciousness, strength, and intellectual prowess. If you think about it, an elephant is the largest and strongest animal, yet it's a vegetarian, it's affectionate, and it's loyal. He can be swayed if love and kindness are extended to him. Ganesh, by extension, is loving, forgiving, and he's moved by the affection of his devotees. An elephant can destroy a whole forest and can be a one-man army when provoked. You've heard about elephant rampages. Ganesh can be ruthless when fighting evil. Now, with the head itself, there's also two other features that are sometimes uh, discussed, sometimes not. And one is that he's got the small eyes of an elephant. 
And in Hinduism, this is a symbolism to remind us to concentrate. I would also say that it might defer to the rather large ears that he has, which also represent a form of wisdom, spoken wisdom usually. And then he's got a small mouth. Talk less, listen more, right? His ears are big, like they're elephant ears, so they're like a winnowing fan. A winnowing fan, uh, if you're not familiar, it's also a biblical reference, but a winnowing fan is what you would use to, uh, you throw up harvested wheat, and when you threw it up into the air, the wheat would be heavier than kind of the junk, like the dead leaves and whatnot. And so the wheat would come down and the wind would blow away the bad stuff, right? So the ears hear everything, but they retain only that which is good. Ganesh listens to all requests made by his devotees. If they are humble or powerful, he listens. Uh, his trunk is a symbol of discrimination. If you watch an elephant, they can use it to uproot trees, and then they can use it to pluck grass. The biggest and smallest of tasks are within the range of the trunk, which is symbolic of Ganesha's intellect and his powers of discrimination and his flexibility. He also has broken tusks. Uh, one tusk is usually attached, the other tusk is broken off. Uh, this is a symbol that represents keeping the good and discarding the bad. And there's actually multiple legends and multiple symbols in this. Two of the stories about Ganesh include a story that one day Ganesh was guarding Shiva's quarters. He does a lot of guarding, right? And a favorite disciple of Shiva's, Parashurama, wants to see the god. And Ganesh says, no, God said he's sleeping, leave us alone. And Parashurama said, yes, but he's my god. He said, I can see him at any time. And a fight broke out. Parashurama threw an axe at Ganesh, which was given to him, this warrior, by Shiva. And Ganesh recognized the axe, and he knew it was his father's. And in a symbol of humility, in acknowledging his father's power, dominion, and his worshiper, he accepted the axe's blow, and he lost his tusk. A second story says that Ganesh was approached by the gods to write down the Mahabharata, uh, which was dictated to him by the sage Vyasa, right? Uh, who also wrote the Ramayana, dictated the Ramayana. This was a huge undertaking. If you've never seen the Mahabharata, it's big. It's a big, big book. And Vishnu knew that the knowledge within this was going to be so important that no mere writing instrument would do. And so he broke off his tusk and dipped it in ink, and he used his tusk to write down the sacred words. And of course, the idea is that no sacrifice is too big for the pursuit of knowledge. His hands. Ganesh has uh, usually four hands, and these are the, the basic symbols. Sometimes you'll also see the lotus mixed in here. The first hand is usually held up in the pose of protection and refuge. If you can imagine somebody telling you to stop and they put their hands straight up in front of you, stop, or those annoying crossing guards, those kids crossing the street and they put their hands up at the whistle, right? That is the pose. So it's a pose of protection and refuge. The second hand holds sweet food, like a sweet meat or kind of a delicacy, which represents the sweetness of the realized inner life. The third hand holds an elephant goat, which is actually used to prod mankind back to the path of righteousness and truth, and it strikes and repels obstacles. He's also sometimes shown holding an axe. He cuts the ties that bind us. The fourth hand holds a noose, which conveys the worldly attachment and desires are an unhealthy bond, and it's sometimes shown holding a lotus, Enlightenment is desired over those unhealthy attachments. And he's got a big old belly, which represents the bounty of nature. It represents Ganesh swallowing the sorrows of the universe and as he actually protects the world. It also represents prosperity, because anybody that can have a big belly like that has got to be doing pretty well. All right, we'll actually pause here for a moment. We'll get some commercials in, and then when we get back, we'll talk about the rest of the symbolism and the little paranoid factoid that goes with Ganesh. We will be right back after these messages. Now, time for something really scary. A word from our sponsors. 
paranormal pets will reappear before you can say Bigfoot. Don't run away. Every pet is unique. Maybe they're gray in the muzzle, yet young at heart. Maybe they're growing out of the puppy stage and into their paws and ears. Or maybe they're just trying to maintain a more girlish figure. At PetSmart, we have the right food for your pet at a great value for you. PetSmart. Be better together. Go to PetSmartDeal.com and save up to 30% on awesome gifts for the pets and pet people in your life. Toys, collars, leashes, PetSmart gift cards, treats, and more. Go to PetSmartDeal.com today. P-E-T-S-M-A-R-T-D-E-A-L.com. I'm not much of a reader, but I do wish I were more well-read. There are so many great books coming out. I wish I could find a way to keep up. Audible.com makes it easy to stay well informed and catch up on your reading simply by listening. Audiobooks from Audible turn downtime into uptime. You'll be more productive and become well read. Now I'm able to catch up on all the great books I've been wanting to read. With Audible, I feel smarter. Pet Life Radio listeners, try Audible.com now and get your first 30 days of Audible Listener Gold Membership Plan free. And get a free audiobook. Choose from over 100,000 titles. To get this great deal, go to audibledeals.com. That's audibledeals.com. Hi, my name is Brent Atwater, and I'm the Animal Reincarnation Authority. Join me every week on Alive Again, and let me look at your pet's energy to determine if they're going to reincarnate. I'll be able to tell you when they're going to come back and what they look like. So send me your pet's photo and email me your question at brent at petliferadio.com. I'm looking forward to answering your questions on Alive Again. Every week only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Did you hear that? Our commercials have mysteriously disappeared. Paranormal Pets is back with our haunted host, our ghost host. So we are going to finish up this talk about Ganesh, I promise. We're getting to my personal favorite part, the rat. The rat, mouse, or shrew, depending on who you're talking to, where you're at, what it looks like, etc. It represents the vehicle that transports the god. This seems impossible for a mouse or a rat to transport an elephant, but nothing is impossible for God. It's a symbol for intellect, because a mouse or a rat goes into places we could not, or that we would not have thought possible. And if you have ever owned a pet rat or mouse, you know that's true. I mean, I have seen rats get out of stuff that I'm like, seriously? Really? Okay. The rat vehicle represents the wandering mind, which is able to be led to undesirable things and to corruption. Not that rats would ever do that. But I have noticed, by the way, that if you give a rat like a sugary piece of cereal or an apple slice, they go for that sugary piece of cereal. So yeah, I guess they can be corrupted. The rat or the mouse also pays subservience to Lord Ganesha, which means that the intellect or desire has been tamed and appropriately focused. And even though God is big and the rat or mouse is small, it's a reminder that even the smallest things have a larger impact and everything starts small and becomes big. Now when it comes to consorts, Ganesh is a riot. In South India, he is the ultimate mama's boy. He is devoted to Parvati, who was his mother that we talked about earlier. He is represented as single and celibate. Why? Because Mama was the most beautiful and perfect woman in the universe. And when somebody said, hey, what are you going to do to get married? He said, bring me a gal just like Mom, as beautiful and wonderful as Mom. And they couldn't find anyone her equal. And so the legend goes, the search is still on. Apologize, I've got pugs with me. Sleeping pugs, apparently. This other set of consorts. Okay. 
Uh, in North India, he is actually shown as being married to the two daughters of Brahman, the Lord of Creation, uh, Budi, Wisdom, and Siddhi, Achievement. And he's sometimes also linked to Riddhi or Prosperity. So it's kind of interesting because he's got at least two wives, right? Maybe three, sometimes one. The yoga paths, the religious philosophies of India, also say that Buddhi, achievement and wisdom, and Siddhi represent the female and male currents in the human body, that we're actually a mixture of both masculine and feminine. So they have additional connections to the worship and the worship, well, let's just say the, the extreme religious devotion of Ganesh. He has some female associates. He is sometimes connected to Sarasvati, the goddess of culture, arts, and knowledge. And he's also connected to Lakshmi, the goddess of luck and prosperity. And in fact, he's oftentimes shown adoring her. Because if you think about it, good beginnings would love luck and prosperity. I mean, it makes sense. So we have actually quite a bit to do with Ganesh. But I get to tell you now the supernatural part of it. Just as an aside, Ganesh is known, the Ganesh statues were known for drinking milk offerings. Similarly to the way that we have weeping icons, they had milk drinking statues. And there are several reports of these milk drinking statues. The first one takes place September 21st, 1995 in New Delhi. There are reports before dawn that milk offerings being given to Ganesh are being drunk by the statues. And apparently throughout the day, uh, it spread from New Delhi to the rest of India, then to Europe, Canada, and was also observed in the United States. There's a temple uh, dedicated to Ganesh in the U.S. August 20th and 21st of 2006, in Uttar Pradesh, there was another drinking incident which spread throughout India. And this actually happened after the reports of people saying that seawater turned sweet in Mumbai, which caused uh, a lot of issues of hysteria. So there were kind of like uh, days apart miracles. Seawater that tasted sweet, and then the statues that drank milk. September 22nd, 2010, the Trinidad Express reported that a Ganesh statue was drinking milk at a Prince Town Trinidad temple during the festival dedicated to Ganesh. Now, the skeptics say that what actually happened is that the statues have are porous, that the statues that are seen drinking milk are actually porous. And so it is the tension within the milk and even the way that the milk's being held, if you will, that allows the milk to be absorbed into the statue. And so scientists kind of poo-pooed it. Whereas religious devotees said, no, we think this is something really legitimate. It doesn't happen all the time. We're not seeing milk all over the floor. So if it was just being absorbed into the statue, it should be showing up later. So it's kind of an interesting little mix. And when I was doing a little bit of research, it indicated there were some indications that there have been other statues that have been seen drinking milk. So kind of an interesting idea. Anyhow, I think we've done pretty well. I again want to wish you a very happy new year. I hope that Ganesh brings you success and that we will meet again for another future episode. Once more, please remember to support your animal rescues. We really need to. Uh, I've discovered a few new rescues these past two weeks. A chihuahua rescue, a schnauzer rescue, even a, a pit bull rescue. Folks that I know have, have had different needs and I have been looking for new, new pets. So please, please support your rescues. Remember that there are plenty of wonderful pets out there. And uh, next episode, I think we'll be looking at some werewolves. So until then, happy haunting. Pet Life Radio presents Paranormal Pets, where you can always expect the unexpected. Each week we'll discuss all aspects of weird or spiritual animal encounters, ghosts, totems, psychic animals, animal souls, animal angels, and animals in religion, with a little cryptozoology thrown in. Step into the supernatural world of pets every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.